Welcome back. In the first part of this chapter, we first went over the hierarchical organization of animal bodies from the tissue level all the way up to the organ system level, and then we talked about various homeostatic mechanisms for maintaining internal conditions within a steady range. So this next part is labeled animal energetics, but what we're going to start off talking about is thermoregulation, and so this really kind of bridges these two topics of homeostasis and energy management because the way in which animals manage and regulate their body temperature is going to have a huge impact on their allocation of energy. So what is thermoregulation? Thermoregulation is the process by which animals maintain an internal temperature within a normal range. So before thinking about how animals are able to maintain a steady temperature, let's think about the different ways in which temperature can be gained or lost by any object. So the first method of heat exchange is conduction. So that's the direct transfer of heat between two physical bodies that are in contact with each other. So for example, if we look at this little rabbit, the solid surface that it's in contact with, the ground, is going to exchange um, heat. Remember, heat is the transfer of thermal energy, so whichever object has more thermal energy is going to transfer that to the object with less, and so heat is going to be transferred probably from the warm bunny to the cold ground, but if the ground is warm, maybe the other way around. The second method of heat exchange is convection. So convection is a special case of conduction in which heat is exchanged between a solid and a liquid or gas rather than between two solids. And so the most important aspect of convection is that that liquid or gas is generally moving. So there's going to be kind of bulk transport of that thermal energy. If we think about wind that's blowing across this rabbit, let's say it's a cold day, the heat is in contact with that air and the wind is going to physically blow that heat away from the rabbit, which is why on a windy day that wind chill factor makes you feel colder than just if the wind were still because that those convection currents are actually physically moving the heat away from your body. Radiation is the transfer of heat between two bodies that are not in direct physical contact. So uh, heat arrives to the earth from the sun through radiation. Um, the earth is always radiating heat away, and so some of that radiant heat from the ground can find its way into animals to warm them up. Anything that is above absolute zero is giving off thermal energy all the time as radiant heat. So heat is lost also through evaporation due to the phase change when liquid water turns into a gas. So we've talked about evaporative cooling when we were looking at the properties of water. So as this rabbit breathes, water is evaporating from its mouth and nose and all the way actually down into its lungs through the um, air that's in its lungs. And so that is a form of, of cooling and it can also be an important form of heat loss. If, so why bother maintaining a temperature? Why not just let your temperature fluctuate with the environment? So one of the things that we've seen over and over again is that at very high temperatures, proteins denature. When they lose their tertiary and quaternary structure, when they lose their shape, they don't function the way they're supposed to, and life could not exist under these conditions where proteins are being denatured. High temperatures can lead to excessive water loss and dehydration, and so that can be an important reason to, to maintain a steady body temperature. And then, of course, low body temperatures can, can slow down enzyme function and energy production, and that can be a big problem. Also, actual freezing of the cell contents is a very bad thing. And also, don't forget about the effect of temperature on cell membrane function. The fluidity of the cell membranes can be affected by low temperatures and the structural integrity of cell membranes can be compromised at high temperatures when those membranes become too fluid, that they become unstable and can rupture. So a lot of good reasons to make sure that bodies are kept within appropriate temperature ranges. What are some of the strategies for thermoregulation? One of the ways we can think about thermoregulatory strategies is how do animals obtain heat? And so this is the difference between an endotherm 
that produces its own heat using metabolic processes, so basically using these exothermic chemical reactions within cells to generate heat, so in addition to generating other kinds of work, they're going to use their cellular metabolism to produce a lot of heat. And this can be compared to an ectotherm that generally relies on heat gained from the environment to maintain whatever body temperature is necessary. So another kind of axis of variation we can think about is whether an animal's body temperature is held constant. So many animals can tolerate larger fluctuations in temperature than others. And so animals that need to keep their body temperatures at a very constant level are called homeotherms. So homeotherms keep their body temperature constant. Animals that are able to tolerate larger fluctuations in body temperature are called poikilotherms. They allow their body temperature to change depending on the environmental conditions. So these are two different ways to think about thermoregulation, but they are not necessarily tied to one another. So a homeotherm is not necessarily an endotherm. A poikilotherm is not necessarily an ectotherm. So let's look at a couple of examples. So humans are endothermic homeotherms. They're what you would expect. We maintain a constant body temperature using metabolic heat generated from within our bodies. But this is actually a continuum. There's a range of possibilities within this. And so even along this endotherm to ectotherm axis, we regulate our body temperature. But if we get too cold, what do we do? We use behavior, turn up the thermostat, put on a jacket to help our bodies to regulate temperature. It's possible for an ectotherm, an organism that relies on heat gain from the environment, to also be a homeotherm and use behaviors to manage changes in temperature to keep it within a very steady range. So for example, a lizard might behaviorally seek out sources of warmth when it detects that its body temperature is too cold. It might seek out shade or water or other cooling things when it detects that its body temperature becomes too warm and use these kinds of behaviors to maintain its temperature within a relatively steady range, in which case it would be a homeotherm. It's keeping its body temperature constant, but it's doing it behaviorally instead of using its body's metabolism. So another couple of examples from your book. African elephants can allow their body temperature to rise during the hotter part of the day, so they're showing some tendencies to being somewhat poikilothermic. Other mammals that go into hibernation or other forms of torpor when it's cold, we'll talk about this at the very end of our discussion in this web lecture, let their body temperatures drop when they're inactive. They're letting their body temperature be dictated somewhat by the environmental conditions and allowing variation. So another example is in Japanese honeybees. They exhibit a form of poikilothermy when defending their hives from predatory hornets. So they contract their flight muscles repeatedly to produce a lot of endothermic heat, and that rise in temperature actually kills the hornet. So they basically boil their enemy to death by generating a lot of metabolic heat. So now let's compare these as life strategies or as energy management strategies. So endotherms can warm themselves because their basal metabolic rates are extremely high. So we'll talk more about what basal metabolic rate is, but basically they're using cellular metabolism to generate heat. If they're using cellular metabolism to generate heat, this is going to use energy, metabolic energy. So the heat given off by a high rate of chemical reactions, exothermic chemical reactions, let's not forget to think back to the core principles. So we're using exothermic chemical reactions to generate heat. And we're gonna do this enough to keep the body warm. So mammals and birds are highly accomplished um, endotherms, and they are able to retain the heat that they generate using insulating mechanisms such as feathers or fur to keep that heat close to the body and limit the amount of heat that's radiated or convected away. Ectotherms gain heat directly from the environment and only generate a small amount of heat as a byproduct of metabolism. So they're not going to just burn up a lot of energy just to produce heat. So most of the heat gain is by radiation or conduction from warm objects in their environment, such as uh, hot rocks that have been out exposed to the sun. 
Endothermia and ectothermia are best understood as contrasting adaptive strategies. So there are different strategies for energy management. So endotherms have higher metabolic rates and thus they can be more active at all times. So because they generate their own heat, they can be active even when it's cold. They don't have to slow down because they don't have enough energy to maintain muscular movement. They can pretty much be active year round and in very cold climates. But this costs a lot of energy and focuses that energy on producing heat versus other energy demanding processes. So this is a very, you might say, wasteful strategy, although it has this benefit of allowing a lot more flexibility in behavior in terms of being able to be active in a wider range of conditions. Ectotherms are able to thrive with much lower intakes of food and can use a greater proportion of their total energy intake to support reproduction. And so this is an energy saving strategy or, or an economical energy strategy. It's not wasteful. So, but muscle activity and digestion slow as body temperature drops. So when it is cold, they're not as able to be active. They can't mobilize that energy as much. So they're limited to when and where they can, they can be active. So heat regulation in mammals often involves the integumentary system. This is true for birds also, if we add feathers to this list. So skin, hair, nails are going to contribute to this thermal regulation. And that makes sense, right? Because the integumentary system is that barrier between the organism and its environment, that border between inside the body and outside the body. And so this is where heat is going to be regulated. And there are five adaptations that help animals to thermoregulate. So we're going to go through all of these in turn, but let's just go through the list. Insulation, circulatory adaptations, cooling by evaporative heat loss, behavioral responses to changing conditions, and also adjustments to the metabolic heat production. So some of these will apply only to endotherms. Some of them will apply equally to endotherms and ectotherms. So let's first look at insulation. So insulation is a major thermoregulatory adaptation in mammals and birds. So fur and feathers are some of the defining features of mammals and birds, respectively. So skin, feathers, fur, and blubber reduce heat flow between an animal and its environment. So that's basically what insulation is. It's making sure that heat isn't exchanged with the environment, and it's particularly important in cold environments and keeping the body warm. Insulation is especially important in marine mammals, such as whales and walruses, that are often in very cold water. So this layer of subcutaneous blubber, which is, by the way, not just fat, but a very highly organized adipose tissue with these networks of collagen fibers that actually help to maintain the smooth, streamlined shape of the body and also are going to help to maintain the body temperature and not exchange heat with that cold water. So one of the ways that animals can help to manage their temperature is by regulating the blood flow either close to the core or out near the surface of the skin. So regulation of blood flow near the body's surface significantly affects thermoregulation. So many endotherms and some ectotherms can alter the amount of blood flowing between the body core and the skin. And we talked a little bit about this idea of being able to use smooth muscles to dilate or constrict the vessels flowing out to the skin to regulate that blood flow. So let's take a look why. When it's very hot out, you wanna get that blood close to the surface where it can easily be transferred out to the environment. The vessels will dilate, we call this vasodilation, increasing the blood flow to the skin and letting that heat from the blood coming from the core be released out into the environment, facilitating heat loss. When it's colder outside, we want to make sure that we keep the core of the body warm. So we're going to constrict those vessels um, using the smooth muscles. This is called vasoconstriction, the constriction of blood vessels. And that's going to limit the blood flow um, to the skin and keep that blood near the core um, where it's going to stay warm, lowering the possibility for losing that heat to the environment. There are also specializations in the arrangement of these blood vessels in especially many marine mammals and a lot of birds that allow for a phenomenon called countercurrent exchange. So what happens here is that 
the arteries that are bringing blood away from the core of the body, away from the heart, are going to be placed next to veins which are delivering blood back toward the heart. So from some kind of extremity like um, a foot or a flipper. And they're going to transfer heat between those two kinds of vessels. So the arteries flowing from the body core are going to be relatively warm compared to the blood flowing from the extremity that's been exposed to the cold. And so as they flow past each other, the warm blood coming from the heart is going to warm up the blood coming back from the cold extremity and cool down progressively as it gets toward that, say, foot that's standing on the ice and the blood that's coming from that cold foot is going to get progressively warmed as it moves back toward the core, conserving that heat and letting the temperature in that extremity just go ahead and drop. To look at this in a more intuitive way rather than just explaining it, so if we think about a Canada goose standing on the ice, its feet are getting very, very cold, there's going to be an artery coming from the heart with nice warm blood that's going to be situated right next to a vein coming back from the foot. And so at every point along this contact, the blood coming down in the artery is a little bit warmer than the blood coming back from the foot. And so heat is gonna be transferred all the way down as it moves along this entire pathway from the artery to the vein. So when we get down to the foot, the temperature is gonna be much lower we're going to let the foot go ahead and get cold in the interest of making sure that these important critical internal organs such as the heart, lungs, um, things like that, maintain a, a nice warm temperature to keep functioning. So the similar thing happens in the fins of cetaceans such as this dolphin, so marine mammals. You're going to have arteries and veins situated right next to each other. In this case, the artery is completely surrounded by veins and the heat is going to flow all the way through down from the artery to the veins so that this arterial blood, by the time it reaches the very tip, is going to be very cold. The venous blood, the cold venous blood is going to come back and is going to be warmed progressively all the way back on its journey back toward the heart so that it's all nice and warmed up before it returns to the heart. Interestingly, in whales this also can happen in the tongue. So the tongue is exposed to the cold water and the whale just lets the temperature in its tongue drop using this countercurrent exchange mechanism to make sure that the blood flowing back from the tongue is warmed up before it gets back to the core of the body. And so we can see in this countercurrent arrangement the heat is always going to be flowing from the arteries to the veins and progressively warming that blood up as it journeys back toward the heart. Now let's take a look at cooling by evaporative heat loss. This is something we see in our day-to-day -day lives if we own dogs. Uh, many types of animals lose heat through evaporation of water through their skin. This is what we do when we sweat. And also sweating or bathing, going for a swim, moistens the skin and facilitates this evaporative heat loss, helping to cool an animal down. And then of course, panting releases a lot of heat from the mouth and also from the lungs, increasing that cooling effect. And we see this in various birds and in many, many mammals. So common to both endotherms and ectotherms, but primarily ectotherms, they're gonna use behavioral responses to control body temperature. So they're gonna do something to actually seek out the necessary temperature that their body requires. So they may seek out warm places, such as this rock that's been exposed to the sunshine and is giving off a lot of radiant heat. They may seek these warm places when they're cold and orient themselves toward heat sources, so basking in the sun like a lizard. When hot, they might bathe, move to cooler areas, maybe move into the shade, or change their orientation with respect to the sun to minimize heat absorption. So they're going to do this behaviorally. Mammals can use these different behavioral um, approaches to help to regulate their temperature as well, but ectotherms rely on it almost exclusively. Another thing that endotherms can do is make adjustments to the amount of metabolic heat that they're producing. So thermogenesis is the adjustment of metabolic heat production to maintain body temperature. So thermogenesis is increased by muscle activity, such as moving or shivering, and so in fact we find this 
Also in some ectotherms, there's an example of a python incubating her eggs and keeping them warm by generating heat by shivering her muscles. So this is something that endotherms and ectotherms can do using muscle activity. Remember that muscle activity is a little bit wasteful. Not all of the energy from that ATP goes directly into creating the motion. M uh, much of it is lost as heat and this heat can be used for thermoregulation. There's also a phenomenon called non-shivering thermogenesis, and this takes place when certain hormonal signals are going to cause mitochondria to increase their metabolic activity and so produce a lot more ATP. When you have a lot of ATP available, it can be used to create these exergonic chemical reactions that are going to release heat and help increase the heat production. Some mammals also have a tissue called brown fat. It's brown because of the high mitochondria content and it's specialized for rapid heat production. So it's going to make use of this non-shivering thermogenesis by upregulating all of these mitochondria in the brown fat and cause them to produce lots of heat. So this is particularly common in mammalian babies to uh, be able to boost their heat production. So it's found in the infants of many mammals and in adult mammals that hibernate. So when you're gonna need extra help generating excess metabolic heat. So the amount of brown fat in human adults has been found to vary depending on the temperature of the surrounding environment. This can be an acclimatization response, adding brown fat. And birds and some even non-avian reptiles can also raise body temperature through shivering. We saw that example in the snake incubating the eggs. So as we mentioned, there can be acclimatization responses and thermoregulation. So birds and mammals can vary the amount of insulation to acclimatize to seasonal temperature changes. If you own a dog, you've definitely noticed a lot of shedding in the summer, getting rid of that winter fur and putting on additional fur, uh, getting ready for the cold season in the fall. We talked about this way back when we were looking at the properties of lipids. So the lipid composition of cell membranes may change with temperature, adding more unsaturated lipids to the cell membranes when it gets colder to improve the fluidity of the membrane, adding more saturated lipids when it's hot to make sure that that membrane doesn't become too fluid and become fragile. When temperatures are below zero, some ectotherms produce these antifreeze compounds, we talked about them in plants, to prevent the growth of ice crystals within the cells. Thermoregulation in mammals is controlled by a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. So we saw the hypothalamus very recently when we were talking about water balance. So the hypothalamus is a major integrating center in the brain that controls a lot of these homeostatic mechanisms. So it's going to be the hypothalamus that will trigger heat loss or heat generating mechanisms, sending signals to the rest of the brain to initiate whatever metabolic changes or behaviors are needed. So we talked about these set points in the integrating centers. The integrating center is going to compare the current conditions to some kind of set point. We have a phenomenon called fever that's going to be a response to some infections, and that's going to reflect an increase in that set point. So the set point is going to be adjusted in response to that infection to help the body fight the infection. And so a fever represents a change in this normal range for the biological thermostat, we're going to tick that set point up a little bit to maintain a higher body temperature until the pathogen is dealt with. We also see something called a behavioral fever in some ectothermic organisms. So if they get an infection that can be dealt with by raising the body temperature somewhat, they'll seek out warmer environments. So the also have a change in the set point, only what's going to be triggered is a behavioral response to seek out more warmth to increase their body temperature in response to those infections. So now let's think more explicitly about bioenergetics and energy management in animals. So bioenergetics is the overall flow and transformation of energy in an animal. So animals are going to allocate energy to different activities. So it's going to determine an animal's nutritional needs and it relates to an animal's size, activity, and environment. So the way an animal manages its energy is going to depend on what kind of animal it is, how big it is, how much it does, and what kind of environment it lives in. So for example, a cheetah 
is going to manage its energy in a much different way than something like a sloth that has a different body size, a very different lifestyle. So energy containing molecules from food are usually used to make ATP, which powers cellular work. So we know this whole process, we looked at cellular respiration in great detail. We've got organic molecules in food that are going to be digested and absorbed by the body. This process is going to be an active process that gives off heat and there's also going to be some waste uh, energy lost in the feces. Not everything is going to be effectively digested. Those nutrient molecules are going to be taken up by the body cells. Um, some of it is going to be lost in nitrogenous waste, um, excretion by the kidneys. Some of it is going to be used for cellular respiration. Some of it is going to be used as carbon skeletons to synthesize other macromolecules. And then cellular, cellular respiration is another point at which some of that energy is lost as heat in the process. After the needs of staying alive are met, remaining food molecules can be used in biosynthesis. So we're going to first meet the needs of cellular respiration to make sure that there's enough energy for the animal to stay alive. Then we're going to use those carbon skeletons and other leftover materials that we are not going to use for creating ATP for biosynthesis, creating new macromolecules to support repair and growth. So biosynthesis includes body growth and repair, synthesis of storage materials such as fat, and production of gametes. So there's going to be an energy allocation to different activities. Just keeping the cells alive, that's going to be the highest priority. Behavior, seeking out food, is going to be sort of the next priority. And then reproduction will be another big priority after that. So there's going to be partitioning of the energy use in different animals. So how can we quantify overall energy use? So metabolic rate is the sum of all of the energy an animal uses for all of these different processes in a given unit of time. So metabolic rate can be estimated by measuring an animal's heat loss. It can be estimated by measuring the amount of oxygen consumed or measuring the amount of carbon dioxide produced in a given length of time. That's actually the most common way of estimating the metabolic rate. You can also, over longer periods of time, keep track of the energy content of all the food that animal eats and collect up the waste products and see how much energy is left in that. And then you can get an idea of how much energy was actually used by the animal over whatever extended period of time. So the baseline metabolic rate, so this is considered to be the metabolic rate that's necessary to just keep the cells alive, just to keep the cells working. So we call this the basal metabolic rate, or BMR, is the metabolic rate of an endotherm at rest at a comfortable temperature. So it's not using energy to thermoregulate, it's not using energy to move around or do anything. Um, this is also usually uh, measured under minimal stress, so the animal's not having any kind of a stress response that's using up energy. This is the minimal baseline amount of energy that's required to keep an endotherm alive. We use a slightly different measure for ectotherms called the standard metabolic rate. It's going to be the metabolic rate of an ectotherm at rest. Both of these also um, specify that the stomach is empty, so they're not using any energy to digest food. So at rest, non-stressed, empty stomach. For endotherms at a comfortable temperature that's not requiring them to use any energy to thermoregulate. For ectotherms, this is going to be for a specific temperature. So you'd have a different standard metabolic rate at one temperature than you would have at a different temperature. So this would be measured at, at different temperatures. So this is sort of the resting metabolic rate. So both rates assume a non-growing, fasting, and non-stressed animal. As you would predict, ectotherms have a much lower metabolic rate than an endotherm of a similar size. So now let's think about how body size affects animal physiology. We've talked a great deal about the geometry of animals as they go from smaller sizes to larger sizes. There's this decrease in surface area to volume ratio um, as you go from smaller body sizes to larger body sizes. So let's think a little bit about how this affects their physiology. So the law of physics affects the anatomy and physiology of living organisms. They are 
uh, physical entities interacting with the physical environment, all the laws of physics and chemistry apply equally to biological systems. So, for example, the force of gravity is going to limit how large an anim animal can be and still be able to move effectively. Body size also has pervasive effects on how animals function, so on the physiology. So large animals need more food than smaller animals do. They've got more cells to feed. They produce more waste, so they're going to um, have an absolute larger food intake and waste output. They're going to take longer to mature. They're going to reproduce more slowly and in general they tend to have longer lifespans. Smaller animals lose heat and water more rapidly. Why? Because you lose heat and to some extent water across the body surface. They've got a much larger surface area relative to their volume. They're going to lose a lot of heat um, a lot more rapidly than a larger animal. And same for water. So we have another version of this basal metabolic rate called the mass-specific basal metabolic rate. And this is a function of body mass. So it's going to be measured in milliliters of oxygen consumed per gram of body mass per hour. So we're going to have that metabolic rate in terms of energy use per unit time, but this is going to be the energy use per unit time per gram of body mass. So this is going to be the mass-specific basal metabolic rate. And on a per gram basis, small animals have higher basal metabolic rates than do large animals. And this is a little bit difficult to test directly, but it's thought that the reason for this is because of that larger amount of heat loss in endothermic mammals. So they have to replace their heat a lot more quickly, and so they're going to have to have a higher basal metabolic rate to be able to replace the heat that's lost. So an elephant has more mass than a mouse, but a gram of elephant tissue consumes much less energy than a single gram of mouse tissue does. So looking at this graphically, we can see here on the y-axis the mass-specific metabolic rate in milliliters of oxygen per gram per hour, and then body mass um, on a logarithmic scale on the x-axis, and we can see elephant down here using very little energy per gram of body mass. And if we go all the way down to the very smallest animal, the shrew, it's going to have an extremely high basal metabolic rate relative to its body size compared to larger animals. Physiologists love these mouse to elephant charts. Body mass really dictates a large number of factors in the physiology of, of animals. Uh, mammals line up very neatly along this curve. So metabolic rate is proportional to body mass to the power of three quarters. This is an exponential function with an exponent less than one, which means that as you get larger, the value goes down. The higher metabolic rate of smaller animals leads to a higher oxygen delivery rate, higher breathing rate, higher heart rate, and greater relative blood volume compared with the larger animals. So all of these physiological processes have to be ramped up to meet these higher metabolic demands. And so again, a lot of these physiological phenomena are going to have a mouse to elephant curve that, that looks some, somewhat similar to this. So obviously the amount of activity that an animal undergoes is going to also greatly affect the metabolic rate for both endotherms and ectotherms. Muscle contractions cost energy. The more of them you do, the more energy you're going to use over the course of a day. So in general, the maximum metabolic rate an animal can sustain is going to be inversely related to the duration of that activity. So ultimately ATP can only be synthesized at some kind of maximum rate so the more intense the activity, the faster you're going to use up those ATP reserves, the shorter the amount of time you're going to be able to sustain that activity before you have to stop and replenish those ATP stores. For most terrestrial animals, the average daily rate of energy consumption is two to four times the basal metabolic rate. So for, and this is for endotherms, or standard metabolic rate for ectotherms. So the, the activities, the normal activities that an animal undergoes is going to use up two to four times more energy than just sitting and resting at a comfortable temperature. The fraction of an animal's energy budget devoted to activity depends on factors such as environment, how much time do you have to spend looking for food, behavior, what kinds of um, activities a particular species needs to engage in, 
um, the body size as we just saw, and also thermoregulation, how much energy needs to be invested in maintaining a steady body temperature. That's going to depend on what kind of climate the animal lives in. So you saw a couple of examples of energy budgets in your textbook. Make sure you take a look at that and think through what are the differences in these factors, environment, behavior, size, and thermoregulation in those animals that are compared that will explain the differences in those energy budgets. So one energy saving mechanism that can be used during times when conditions are not optimal for animal activity is a phenomenon called torpor. So torpor is a physiological state of decreased activity and metabolism. And we generally associate this with uh, low temperatures in the winter, but there are other reasons an animal might enter a torpid state uh, in addition to that. So torpor enables animals to save energy while avoiding difficult and dangerous conditions. So they're just going to shut down and wait it out until conditions are better. Sort of like dormancy that we saw in plant seeds waiting for the optimal conditions for growth. Hibernation during the winter is a long-term torpor that is an adaptation to winter cold and food scarcity. So the animal will just lower its metabolism, find a safe spot, and just basically go into this low energy hibernation state for the duration of the winter until conditions are better. Metabolic rates during hibernation can be 20 times lower than if the animal attempted to maintain normal body temperatures. So they're going to let their temperature drop. So this is an, another example of how a homeotherm can have poikilothermic tendencies. And recent research has found that the molecular components of the biological clock, these clock proteins that are synthesized at a steady rate, they actually stop oscillating during hibernation. It's been found that it's not just due to the absence of light and dark signals, that it's actually a response to this lowered metabolic rate. They're going to stop having those circadian rhythms um, during the period of torpor. In addition to hibernation or other kinds of low temperature torpors, there's also a phenomenon called estivation, which can happen in response to high temperatures and also very dry conditions. That's going to enable animals to survive long periods of high temperatures and scarce water by just lowering their metabolic rate, decreasing their activity, finding a nice cool spot to wait out the hot and dry conditions. And these are not just seasonal, there can be daily torpor cycles that are used to avoid unfavorable conditions on a daily basis, and this is going to be adapted to particular feeding patterns in some small mammals and birds. So your book wraps up this chapter by doing a detailed comparison between the different adaptive life strategies that we saw in the plant chapter and using them as kind of a preview for the different kinds of adaptive strategies we're going to see as we go through the different animal systems. And I just wanted to, I'm not going to go over these comparisons in any detail, but I just wanted to point out to you that this is something that we've actually been doing over and over through the course of the semester with this list of things that all living things do, comparing these kinds of strategies, not just between plants and animals, but between everything that's alive. So we've got this environmental response. So response to the environment has been a recurring theme that we've seen from unicellular organisms through plants. And again, this is what we're moving toward in animals. Transformation of energy is one of the items on the list we've been looking at over and over again. This is this comparison that the book calls nutritional mode, photosynthesis in plants, heterotrophy in animals, growth and regulation. So growth was one of the items on that list and regulation has to do with homeostasis. Mass transport we've been talking about with respect to multicellular organisms only. It's not on that list of things that every living thing has to do, but this is a major theme that we keep coming back to. Reproduction, the transmission of information through generations, through the act of reproduction, both DNA replication and also organismal reproduction. Um, absorption has to do with multicellularity. We've been making these comparisons all along gas exchange. And so make sure that you read through that section in your book and think of it in the context of this list that I keep showing you um, since the very first day of class and throughout the semester. So of course, the next connection that we're going to be working on, we looked in detail at response to the environment in plants, and we're going to start thinking about that with the next class when we start to think about 
the nervous system and how the nervous system enables animals to respond effectively to their environment.